So uh, let's see. Today we're going to talk about gRPC, and I'm going to try and make you uh, love gRPC. Uh, I'm going to ask you at the end uh, if I manage to do that. So who am I? First, uh, my name is Rina Skurtu. I'm a software architect at a company called Endava. I'm from Romania. Um, I teach .NET, and from time to time, I also blog. That's my blog, and uh, this is where you'll find the resources for uh, for this talk, the slides, and the GitHub link. So, gRPC, why the fuss, and why do I chose this? So, first of all, uh, we need to know everything that is out there in order to make an informed decision whenever it is the case, right? So, uh, us developers, we're trying to work with the latest technologies out there, but the latest technologies out there are not often the most suitable things for our project, right? So in order to pick the right one, we need to know the technologies and to know what the applicability uh, cases for that specific technology. So let's go ahead and have some history lesson. So the monolith. Uh, I always like to, to talk about the monoliths, because when I started 12 years ago or something like that, uh, the monoliths were the default projects. Everything was a monolith. We had huge projects. We worked with um, web forms, I think, at that moment. And we had big solutions and not so good computers. And I remember that every time we needed to build a solution, we might have as well move on and take a coffee because it was free time for us. The build took so long, you know, but for us as developers, there was an easy life because whenever you needed something, that something was in the code. And in the code me meant that you could instantiate the class. You could go ahead and grab something and it was there. But the deal with the monolith is that is somehow hard to scale. It's not impossible. You can scale that. We have the tools and the means right now. But scaling a monolith means to scale the whole block. And maybe not the whole block is so used by our users. And when we scale something that is not needed, it means that somehow we are losing money or the business is losing money. And we do not want that. But of course, as developers, we kind of do not care about that that often, right? We have some other people in our team to, to care about budgets and all. But even so, the, the things evolved. So we moved away um, and we have, we had then MVC because I came from a .NET background, you know, and I love .NET. And then MVC appeared and we had front end and we had back end, but these two things were very coupled. Uh, there was HTML render from the server side, but it was a way nicer approach than web forms, right? So the future tells us that these things also evolved. And now we have front end, and now we have back end APIs, and we have databases, and everything is decoupled, or we want to keep everything decoupled. And doing that, it means that we will have a lot of things to worry about. We will have many server-side apps that communicate with a single front-end on several front-ends. And now we need to, I don't know, worry about orchestrating this. Now we do not have the whole block. And now we need to think, hmm, I, if I do this, I might break some other API and so on. Or you might think that, okay, how do I get data from other API, right? And the future, we like it or not, the future is distributed. And that distribution comes with something that is, is hard for us as developers. Now we might have architectures like this. Now we might have a single front end, several backends, and that sev those several backends that communicate with several uh, databases, and maybe with some other backends. Why not? Maybe we're calling other APIs from the server side, right? And well, things are getting complicated. Once that you are adding an extra layer, 
then things are not so easy anymore. And then you might add up and need things like this. You might code in .NET Core in C Sharp, but maybe you need a component that is written in Go or in Node.js, or I don't know, you need to communicate with the server-side um, third-party API. And how do you manage this? You need a common ground for all these technologies. So you might say, okay, but we have a common ground. We have JSON. And I, I will say, okay, you have JSON, but how do you distribute HTTP clients? Let's say that we have the case where we have Nugget, right? We want to have HTTP clients to be able to distribute them with Nugget packages. We hard code them, we code them, we add logic, everything, just to add data from another API that is also written by us, okay? And how do we do that? We create Nugget packages, we share them and blah, 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 everything is fine. But the deal with Nugget packages, once you start growing them, is that they become spaghetti, a spaghetti of references. And microservices, as an architecture, uh, they, they tend to have a goal and they meant to keep everything decoupled. But once you introduce a Nugget package, you kind of have a reference and you kind of have a coupling of some kind. And another deal with the Nugget packages that you create first to distribute HTTP clients is that they tend to grow and they tend to become fat and to get some additional logic that has nothing to do with the initial purpose. So they receive business logic in there and I don't know what else, but they become big and brittle and they defeat the purpose. Okay. And it's not so nice to share Nugget packages between your APIs, a lot of them, because I know you work with microservices and uh, this might be a way of getting data from one service to another, right? And why the need with, uh, of any other technology if we have REST for everything? We have those HTTP clients that we're sharing through Nugget and we're creating REST APIs. And okay. We have REST for everything, but uh, REST as a concept, very cool. If you know the deal and the underneath uh, things from, uh, from REST, but the communication is very simple. We have a client, we have a server, and in between there is a request and a response. But before we get the response, there is something that is called a content negotiation. And that content negotiation is a process that happens behind the scenes without us knowing that takes care about a few things. And a few of these things are the format of the request. For example, what is the, uh, the format that the client understands and expects as a response? What is the payload of the request or the response? How do you handle errors? or how do you handle retries uh, or authentication? And what do you do if the model changes? For example, a property or several properties are removed from the backend. You on the client side or in the consumer side, does, doesn't need to be a front-end app. It also can be a server app, another API. If the model changes, what happens? Well, there are ways of preventing that, but still, if the model changes, uh, first, the client might break, right? If you don't have tests to cover yourself. Um, and how do you handle and how do you make your, the client be aware that, hey, on the server side, the model changed, either by adding or removing things? You might go ahead and say to your colleague, hey, you're working on the front end or in the receiving party, go ahead and remove that because it's not coming anymore from, from the server. But what if you do not, you cannot do that? How do you handle the model changes? For example, let's say you are coding an API that is consumed by many parties, but you do not know who are those parties. How do you force them to 
to be aware and to change themselves when you're changing the model. So you need to find a way. Okay, then you might say, okay, what's wrong with REST? It works. We're sending data over HTTP. We're saying that we're having REST APIs. But to me, sometimes REST has a problem when it's not done properly. For example, it forces you to have a communication inside your team. If you're lucky enough to have the possibility to, to have that communication, uh, it forces the, the team to have this conversation like, hey, you're going to use this info. Hey, add that field in the UI or in the consumer uh, application. Hey, uh, extract that, remove that. That is not, not needed. Please add two fields and so on. And this communication takes time. And more often than not, as developers inside our teams, we're very rushed to do things because we want to deliver fast and the business wants us to deliver fast. And we kind of do not have time to chit chat about what fields need to be, to be removed or added and so on in order not to crash. So here goes remote procedure calls. So remote pro procedure calls as a term is there for a long time, uh, since seventies or something like that. So it's not new, it's just new inside our world in .NET. What it does is to make the system or several systems, a distributed system, behave like it's, it's part of the same, the same uh, monolith, let's say. So makes the system seems in the same place. For example, let's have a look at some code. We have a variable named order that uh, calls a method create order of a specific order request. Okay, nothing fancy, it's easier. The code that we're calling looks very local, right? Let's have a look further. We have another variable, payment status, processes the payment for that specific order. And then we're checking if the payment status is, is successful. What do we do? We are in the shipping for it. Neat, right? It's like in a monolith, it's there for us to use. But how, if I how about if I tell you that between these two, there is a small network call involved. So uh, the code that we're using, it's very local, developer oriented, it's methods, services, and so on, right? But if we have a closer look, there is network involved. So the call for process payment for it's actually made over the network, does a whole over, over the network and does things. So RPC as a concept makes the code look local and sometimes is prone to errors just because the developers are forgetting that they're using this, this approach and this technology and they might over abuse, right? You might make several network calls by, just by calling some as a method because they look so code alike. So the goal of RPC is to make network communication transparent. So in a way, it allows you to have a distributed system that kind of behaves like a monolith, right? Just this is the the main purpose of RPC. Now you'll say, okay, okay, RPC, but gRPC, what's gRPC, and what's the the, the use of it? So a short history, uh, it appeared in 2001 as Google's Tabby project. In 2005, it was open source. Then we, in 2016, we had gRPC v1. And further along, in 2019, we had it with .NET Core as first class citizen. So gRPC is contract based. Uh, it's something like, it looks like an interface. You have a contract. We always say that an interface in C Sharp is like a contract. Well, gRPC, it's pretty much the same. We will have no code references, so no more Nugget code packages sharing. It will use HTTP2 by default, which means that it will be way faster out of the box without us doing anything. It uses something that is called protobuf serialization, which ends up us having smaller payload 
And of course, another very cool thing is that available in many languages. And this will allow us to interoperate. You might have a Go uh, application that communicates with the .NET one, and it's very nice without having the, the JSON payload that it could be common for both of them. Code generation, it will generate code for us. And it's pretty nice because everything is out there for us to use. Okay, so now if in REST or HTTP standard way of communication, we would have a client and a server that communicate. Now we have something in between. That is the proto file. And that proto file is the interface, is the contract between the two. As long as the, as the two party understand themselves, well, the two party can communicate. Okay, so what's the proto file? The proto file, uh, it's a special syntax file that kind of looks like this. Uh, you'll have a cool syntax that is, as first line in the code, it's a file with the dot proto extension, that's it. And inside it, you need to tell what's the syntax of the proto that you're using. Currently it's proto three, it's made by Google. Uh, then you need to say, okay, this is the C sharp namespace that I'm gonna use, namely my first gRPC, and then the generated package that is called Fibonacci in our case. And then you need to go ahead and say, what is the server's definition? What you want to expose? And how do you do that is simply by adding a service keyword, giving it a name, and then inside it, you have something that is specific, like let's say it's like an interface, right? You need to say it, this is an RPC service because we're working with services. It has the name Compute Fibonacci. It has as an input, a type that is uh, called requested numbers and returns this type, okay? So this is the interface. You're saying what you're exposing to the outside world. And what you're exposing is this specific method, Compute Fibonacci, with that specific input and that specific output. Further along, you need to define the types that you're using. You cannot uh, make a proto file without it. And these types are implemented or defined as messages. You have the keyword message and you give it a name and then inside it, you will have properties. And one of the property is, in this case is number, and in the second case is result, okay? And of course you can have types and you should have types for it. This is an integer 32 and you'll have something in here that is mainly strange, but it's not. This is not an, assi an assignment. This is actually the order of the field inside that specific, um, that specific type. For example, you would have another field here you'll, you will have equal to and so on because it's binary and it needs to know how to be deserialized. Okay, so uh, you will see in Rider, you have a very cool extension that will have some sort of intelligence to give you the types that are available for Proto. I will show you that at the end. Okay, so you need to define everything and this everything will go in a specific project, okay? So before digging into some code, because I have a few demos, we need to talk about gRPC types. And these types uh, are also called modes, methods. Uh, it depends on who you are talking with, but are types of working with gRPC. And the first method or mode is called unary, which is the classical request response that we know from HTTP or from our REST APIs. The second one is server streaming, where the server sends several responses to the specific client. Client streaming, where the client sends several, let's call them pieces of request to the server. And bidirectional streaming, or we have the, the both combined. So, uh, the client is sending several things in, and the server is responding with several things out, okay? So how these are looking, it's pretty much like this. Unary request response. The client initiates the request, the server gets the request, processes that, and sends back a response. 
And if you were to define such a type of method inside your proto file, you would have something like this. Okay, so it's an RPC. This is the name of the method. This is the input name and returns one thing out. So one thing in and one thing out pretty much. Okay, this is the most easy that we, you can find. The next one is called server streaming. And again, uh, the communication with the server in, is initiated by the client. You cannot push things like you would do with SignalR, for example. So server streaming, one thing, what will happen is that the client sends one thing in and the server will send several pieces of things out, okay? And how do you represent this in the service is by adding a nice keyword called stream. You see, you have one thing in and you have a stream of things out. So this is how you represent this when you write your proto file. Client streaming is similar somehow. Again, the client needs to be the one that initiates the, the, the communication uh, and it will send several things in, but the server will respond with only one thing. How do you do this? So it's simply by adding the stream keyword in here. So a stream of things in, so several things in, and it will return one thing out, okay? Imagine this as being uh, very useful for uploading files. You have a big file that you want to upload to the server and during in one connection, the, that thing will be split into pieces and uploaded and it will be very, very fast. Um, for uploading data from different servers, uh, sensors, sorry, also might be a good scenario or to collect data from, uh, from different uh, clients. And the last one is bi-directional streaming, which is a combination of the previous two. Again, the client needs to be the one that initiates, sends several things in, and it will receive several things out, okay? How do you represent this in code? It's simply by adding uh, the stream keyword here and there. So several things in and several things out, okay? Multiple in, multiple out. Okay, so um, let's have a look and see some code, right? Enough with the talk. I will use uh, Visual Studio just because uh, I tested this and my computer didn't crash. I'm using different uh, things for streaming and uh, I don't have such a good laptop. So I will go with <clears throat> Visual Studio, create new project. And then you'll have here an ASP Core gRPC service. I'm going to click next. And I'm going to talk with you for a bit because it will take a while. <laughs> Okay, so in here you have to choose what's the version of it. It also doesn't matter right now because there aren't so many things uh, changed from one version to another uh, in gRPC, not to my knowledge at, at least. But I'm going to go with .NET 5 and it will create some a project. And what you'll see, uh, it's something that should be familiar because we... You either work with ASP MVC Core or Web API, and some things are, are there. Okay. So on the right hand side, if things are loading, you'll see a project structure that is known. And I'm going to try to zoom it for a bit. So you're going to see the startup CS, program CS, upsetting JSON. And this is this is familiar, okay? But you'll see that you'll have no controllers because we won't work with controllers in gRPC in a gRPC project. But you'll have a folder named Protos where you should add your proto files, and it also com comes with a default um, example that will um, will help you understand what is this about, and also the services 
So it's up to you how you, you handle things around uh, services. But what's a gRPC project? It's nothing else, nothing more than a console that uh, it has a adds a few things. <clears throat> Come on, open yourself. I need to take care of where I click <laughs> in order not to, to break this. But uh, in startups, yes, uh, you'll see some familiar code. But in configure services, you'll see that there is a middleware in here. Services add gRPC. And that's the middleware that allows you to work with gRPC. And also, in the use endpoints, uh, there is a mapping that says, OK, I have an endpoint that maps a gRPC service, namely grid or service that is in the project out there. Uh, and pretty much this is this is it. Nothing, nothing fancy about it. But if we have a look in the proto file, and we'll see the grid.proto, it's uh, the exact, I'm going to make this bigger a bit. We're going to see the same syntax that I showed you in the, um, in the slides. So we have the syntax for the proto files. We have the c -sharp namespace, which is the project name, and the pack package that we need to, to generate. And in here, you'll have the service that it will be exposed with the name. And also inside it, there is one method defined that since you do not see the stream keyword anywhere, you can assume this is unary. So one thing in, one thing out, request response in the traditional way. Um, and pretty much this is the interface definition. So this file can be taken out and shared uh, through different ways. And in the services, you'll see something that is inheriting for from uh, greeter, which is the package that we, it was in there, called greeter base. Well, remember that I told you that we have code generation? Well, the code, here it is, the code generation. So the code generation, if I F12 is and it doesn't die, it's something that is strangely looking, but it does the job and it works. Uh, you see that is a public abstract partial class called greater base that exposes a few things. And it has a, a service implementation. And pretty much this is it. I bet you haven't seen this kind of code <laughs> for a long while. Okay, but this base allows us to say that, hey, this is a service that implements something that is in a proto file, namely this. Okay. And inside it, uh, it's a service that it's a classical one, nothing fancy about it. You can have constructors, you can inject things in it, you can add repositories or other services. Uh, it's up to you how you, uh, you inject and if you inject things in here. But what you need to do is to actually give an implementation. And that implementation is for the methods that are exposed in the uh, in the proto file just exactly like we have in interfaces in c sharp an interface is a contract is definition that says hey if there is a class that uses this it might as well give an implementation so the same happens with services that inherit from bases from the proto files so what you have in here is a say hello method that has an input called hello request and does something, it returns a hello reply, okay? And what you'll see here as a second parameter that you cannot get rid of, it's server call context. It's something similar to an HTTP context that we are familiar with from Web API or MVC. So like it or not, you'll have the second parameter or the third parameter uh, of this type with every method that you will actually implement, okay? So say hello, hello request, sends a hello reply. Let's have a look. An RPC, hello, in inputs, hello request, outputs, hello reply. But in your implementation, this will be uh, tasks, okay? And pretty much this is it to, to get running. 
uh, and I'm going to close this and I'm going to go and show you an actual demo uh, for all these four methods. So what I have in here is a suite of projects. I have a server, which is the actual gRPC implementation. And I also have one, two, three, four other console apps. Okay. And for each of those, I will show to a, uh, to a dummy example uh, with four loops, what's happening inside it. Okay. So let's see. In the server part, uh, you're going to see that we have packages. And in the packages, we have gRPC core, which is a um, it's an old version, but now we do not have the, the pre one. gRPC core allows you to work with proto files. And inside it, we have grid.proto that in my case has four methods. The say hello that sends a greeting that we, we currently saw. Then we have the server stream, client stream, and bidirectional one. And we will take each of these and look at, uh, at it independently. Okay, uh, let's see the proto file. This is here. Uh, and what I'll have to show you is if you right click and edit the project file, you'll see uh, a thing, an item group that says, hey, uh, this is an item group. It has a proto buff and includes this path to find the specific proto file. And it acts as a server for gRPC services, okay? Uh, this path with include here allows you to uh, have the proto files, maybe not inside the same solution, maybe in a specific path on a virtual path or somewhere, okay? So if you want not to keep the proto file inside the same, the same project, you need to go ahead here and to specify the specific path, whatever suits your needs, okay? So this is gRPC. Uh, server. And this is how you say that this is a server for gRPC, just by adding gRPC and uh, putting the server there. Okay. Okay, let's look at the unary one, because it's the easiest one. So what I have in here, it's a console app. Okay. That if you do not believe me, <laughs> I'm going to show you. Um, I told you about not sharing references and not sharing nugget packages. And here it is. So what we have here as packages is Google Protobuf, gRPC, and gRPC tools. These three were needed when I started to, to demo this. So console app, nothing fancy. These three packages you need in order to work with gRPC. But in the program CS, you see some things. For example, uh, you have the concept of a channel. And gRPC, there is the concept of a channel. Um, if you work with the RabbitMQ, maybe the concept of a, of a channel might be familiar. So a channel is something that points up to a location, and this is loca the location of the server that you'll have um, running and gRPC server, right? And as the second parameter for this channel, you can uh, provide credential, and these credentials at, at the ch channel level Okay, so it's not per request, it's for, for the channel. You have two ways of uh, securing these. So in our case, because it's the demo, we do not need not anything fancy. And we're going to say that this is insecure. It works, it's fine. Okay, the next step to work with gRPC or to call a gRPC server is create a client. And to create a client, you can go ahead and just call, call it. Well, and now I'm going to say, mm -hmm. so where does this came from? Because I do not have a reference to the initial server project. It's not there. And I'm going to show you how I did this. So greeter, greeter client, and pass in the channel. It's done automatically by the code generation that I mentioned. So with the greeter client, it's implemented by default, generated for us. Okay. We pass the channel and then we'll be able to use the client in order to call our methods. It's very sim similar to how we are working with uh, HTTP, HTTP clients, right? Create new client, blah, 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 pass in the location and 
you just call the, the endpoints. Okay, so what we do here is uh, create a hello request. I'm gonna write this into console because we need to also track that. And here, we are waiting for the reply. And what to see? Our client has our methods in here. So the methods that we exposed, bidirectional client stream, say hello, server stream, are there for us to use. So it's up to us what we want to use. So we pass in the requests and then um, we can also have call options. We're gonna talk about these later. And we're gonna wait for this. And you say, okay, I have a channel because I have some gRPC packages. I have the clients, but okay, how does this know where to call? Okay, now I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna edit the project, uh, edit project file. And we're going to look over the same kind of thing, an item group with the protobuf. And this time you'll see that we have an include that points out to a different path. And actually this path is somewhere pointing in the server project. Of course, you can also take that and sit outside of your specific projects. But this time the type of the service it's not server anymore, it's client. So this is how you tell that this project behaves like a client for a specific uh, thing, okay? Cool. So pretty much this is it. And now uh, we're gonna look at some console. So in here, you'll have the server and on the right-hand side, you'll have the client, okay? And you'll see this communicating with each other. So on the right hand side, I'm going to run the server. You cannot get rid of, it, of this because this is how it works. We decouple things, but not that much in order for them not to be uh, online at the same time. So, okay, uh, what we see here is that now our application is listening. And on the right hand side, we're going to make the, the client make some requests. So you see that the server is waiting for requests and the client's sending things. And it's very good for the demo because it works so slow in my, on my machine because you see it sends jetbrains.net days. And in here, there is a thing that happened. And this thing that happened is that uh, we received some info about it. Like a request finished is of type HTTP2. It's also type post. So when we're working on, when, with gRPC, we forget about any other verbs except post. Everything that happens, it's post as requests, okay? Uh, you also see that it's a post request made to this specific location. And you see that it's not some, it's a combination of a URL that we know of and then a method call. We have greeter slash say hello. It, it's strange. Uh, and then you'll have a MIME type, which is application gRPC, and some uh, information about the actual status code, HTTP related. It's a 200, okay? And also a thing about how long it took. And what we get back as a response is something like, hello, jetbrains.net days, okay? And this is how, how it works. Every uh, call that you make through gRPC, it, it looks like this. Okay, so let's see. This is the unary one. The, let's say, client streaming is the same, a console app. Uh, it's somehow similar. We have a channel that it's insecure. We have a client and we are using that client to uh, send things to the server. And what do we send to the server is this va the value of the I from this specific loop. Um, okay, client stream, and what do we do in order to send them is to say, hey, await from the request stream and write a sync this type. So inside that loop for that specific uh, amount of, of time, because it will take them, I'm gonna um, delete a zero from here. And what do we do is to wait that stream to be completed and wait for the response. And pretty much this is it. Let's see how it looks. 
uh, in also in the server side because we have an implementation that we're calling, right? So the say hello one is the same as in the previous uh, example. And the client stream, gonna minimize this. Uh, it's somehow similar. It's uh, an iSync, I async stream reader of hello request. So many things in the client is the one that sends things in. Um, and inside it, we have a base message that behaves like a response and says, okay, I got, and here it will be the last I that it will be received on server side. What you do here is uh, while you have things in the request stream, so while you're receiving things, uh, just take the current stream it's, this is exactly as we we know in HTTP client HTTP uh, uh, context dot current dot request dot something uh, in Web API, and then we just concatenate this and return the reply. And as I mentioned, you cannot get rid of the this parameter; it gives you the current context of the call. So this is this is all. So the server still uh, still waits, and the client streaming part. Uh, we're gonna run and hopefully it will will work. Fingers crossed. You see, the server gets things and it, it got enough things. And uh, what happened uh, in here is that okay, it it got that amount of I and the client that initiated the, the re several requests, got the last value of the I, so 99, so on, okay? So where the request was made is in the service client stream with the same approach. It was it was a HTTP2 post request at that specific path. Okay, so several things in to the server and one thing out. So this is it. And it, the same. We edited the project file and we made it as being the client. Okay, client stream. Let's see about the server stream. Again, there is nothing too fancy about it. Uh, the channel, the client, and in here, instead of calling the client method, we're calling the server stream. And also we're passing a few parameters. And these parameters can be something as being, you can also add deadlines. Like, hey, uh, if I do not get an answer in this specific amount of time, and in this case, I added one millisecond, uh, might consider this as being, okay, uh, this is the deadline. If it's not accomplished, then throw an exception. And also you can have a cancellation token if you want, but these are the options for um, that you can send with your calls. So what you, we're doing here is, uh, if the server is the one that receives, so we write things uh, in the response stream, we read everything that we got, get in the response stream and write them to the console. And let's see how this is working. Server is waiting and the server will be sending things. And now on the server side, you shouldn't see things happening because we get back the greetings timeout, okay? Remember that I added in here uh, the deadline as being one millisecond. And of course, one millisecond is very fast and this is how we get the, the deadline. Because I also want to show you the, the exception part of the gRPC. For example, uh, the deadline exceeded, okay? More than one millisecond passed and it, it got to here and we received an RPC exception with the specific status code, namely deadline exceeded. And if that happened, we write things in the console as being greeting timeout. And uh, remember the stat status codes that we're playing with right now in here are not related to, to HTTP as, as a concept. They're not the ones 404 and so on that we know of. These are related to a gRPC. They have the same name but their signification is totally different. Uh, you see that we have aborted, uh, already exists, canceled data loss, a uh, failed precondition, invalid argument, out of range, permission denied, blah, blah, blah. There are a few of them 
Okay, but these are specifically to the gRPC, not the HTTP related. Okay, so this is how you can uh, treat things. And if you were to have some authentication in place, you can also check this and throw an exception, like unauthenticated. Okay, I'm going to comment this out and uncomment the other part one. Um, one, because I want to show you how it's working. Let's see. You see that the server is sending things to the client. It's the other way around. On the left-hand side, it's nothing moving, but in the right-hand side, we're still getting an I because that's the example I'm using. Okay, so you see, we're receiving hello, 9000 and so on, okay? And also, there is another thing that I want to show you. There is this message uh, added here, uh, namely, found some trailer values gRPC header. In gRPC, because you're only doing post requests, you have pretty much no way of uh, working with the classical headers from HTTP, and then, they inv uh, invented things that are called trailers. So you have here get trailers and you get the current streaming call. And you, you have dictionaries where you can look after pairs of, of data. And this way you can mimic uh, the headers that we have in HTTP, the classical way. So a trailer is nothing else than a... a dictionary of key value pair that you add uh, from your implementation. And this is what I added in here. So on the server streaming, on the implementation for the specific method, so client stream, server stream. Uh, let me show you what I did. So it's one request in and a server stream writer of out. So several things out, okay? And again, there is a loop that goes to this number that sends se replies, several things out. And we simply just write things. And in order to mimic the headers, you have this option. You have to create a metadata entry uh, with uh, key and value. And to add, you have the ability to add that key value to the current context. Remember the server called context? Right, this is where you can add those. In response trailers, you can add the pair. And this way, bam, you have headers in gRPC, okay? So a way of mimicking it, at least. Uh, and another, and the last one, you have the bidirectional one, uh, which is, again, similar. You have this channel, you have the client, and in here, you somehow need to, to wait from one side in, uh, and the other side. So you can call from the client the bidirectional method that you exposed, and then you need to wait while you have things in the response stream and to decode them. And you'll see the, the syntax that is response stream current is somehow very close to HTTP context, current request or response that we knew of. Uh, and we write them, and then creating the requests, you have pretty much the, the same approach, but this time you're awaiting the request stream, and you're writing there, okay? And wait the re uh, request stream to complete, and pretty much this is it. So uh, you're listening and waiting on the both, uh, both ends to see if you have things. And let's see how this is working. The server is running and the bidirectional streaming will be built. Okay. Let's see. I hope it won't take long. Huh. I'm going to run again because <laughs> I want a demo where these are not ordered. And sometimes are not ordered depending on how uh, my machine behaves and this time behaves. Okay, so uh, the client sends these things to the server, and as a response, it receives this. But these are not necessarily ordered. It happened because my machine 
currently it works. But uh, if you run this several times, you might see that is not not ordered because that's not uh, you cannot expect this to be ordered. Okay, it's async, and in async, anything can happen. Okay, so let's see another thing and the last thing: the implementation on the greater service for bidirectional one. So again, bidirectional, it has an a stream of things in and a stream of things out, okay? And you see, as long as you have things to write, you get the current stream and then you write those uh, back. So this is all the fast about it. Okay, let's see if I wanted or not to show you thing, anything else. Nope, but we need to go over a few slides. So what are the strengths? And uh, I know a lot of people are comparing RPC or gRPC with WCF, and they uh, are uh, entitled to do that. But I'm comparing it to REST because it might be familiar to a lot of you. So REST is resource-focused, embraces all the HTTP semantics, and it should embrace all HTTP semantics. It will give you a so-called loose coupling, and it's very text-based. You can understand that's coming there. And RPC or GS RPC, namely, is action based, is very programmatic oriented. It embraces the programming semantics. You call methods, not endpoints, and it's very familiar to us. And it gives you somehow a tighter coupling because you're coupling the code somehow. It's binary. And since it's binary, you cannot read it by yourself. You need additional tools. In performance, GRPC is way smaller because it's, it has um, an efficient serialization. It's good for polyglot environments, lightweight, and uh, it's perfect for point-to-point -point communication. Yeah, you're calling method and you know specifically what method do you call, but you shouldn't forget that there is network involved. So the contract base, it's awesome. It has smaller payloads. HTTP 2 and supports different streaming types that might suit a lot of business scenarios. And in downsides, we cannot talk about a technology without thinking about its downsides. And one of them might be the temporal coupling. Unlike messaging, for example, you need both systems to be up. Just like you have, just like you need them in REST when you have REST APIs. You need both systems to be up in order for them to communicate. Same, it's happening here. If the server is down, bad for you. You won't get data from the server. And also, as developer, you might forget that there is network involved and you might abuse the network calls because, as I, as I mentioned, it makes the distributed systems look and behave like monolith. And it's not human readable. And you also might need better testing because it's not human readable. Uh, and it will kind of force you to focus on CI CD because, uh, well, you'll need to find a way of distributing the proto file and to make them um, backward compatible or forward compatible or whatever. But you need to make sure that the systems that need the proto file have access to that proto file. And as a summary, it has four methods, the couples code, you won't have nugget package sharing, no code references, and the only reference will be that proto file that you'll be sharing. It will be perfect for polyglot environments, great choice for microservice communication, a way better choice than HTTP clients. Uh, and I think the future of web APIs, or some of them, it will be that there will be no more hunting of documentation, no misinterpretation of status codes or data parse errors because that's an important um, thing. And also, I believe that if we have a distributed system, these are all about trade-offs. We need to choose the right tool for the job. And as next step steps, you might have a look at gRPC web from browser to, <laughs> to, the, to your API, HTTP2 as a spec, Proto3 as a syntax, um, and what it has to offer. And if you love uh, curl, there is a gRPC curl under development uh, from the community.
that you might use. You have the ability to make calls from the console. And the book, I cannot leave here without mentioning a book, um, is gRPC for W developers. It has a lot of comparison with WCF, but also has a lot of info about gRPC as a concept and as a whole. Uh, Mark Randall uh, did a very good job with, with this. And also, um, I wanted to show you a writer and um, a cool thing that I noticed. Uh, I just started using Rider and I'm really enjoying it. After so many years of using Visual Studio and then adapting to Visual Studio code and so on. But uh, in Rider, we have something very cool, very, very cool, uh, that you cannot find anywhere else. It's an editor <laughs> for, for proto files. So um, it's the same project that I'm going to open here. And it's a pl um, plugin installed. Let's see if if I close this. Fingers crossed. So you have this proto file where you'll get some syntax. Come on, come on, come on. So uh, okay, stop now. For example, in here, you can see what types are available. My computer. Hope it, it won't die at the end. So in here, it works because my, my CPU is spiking. In here, you uh, might have some IntelliSense. It will give you the, the types that are available in Proto and some other um, syntax hints which is very awesome because when you first start with gRPC, you simply cannot know proto syntax by heart and you need to go ahead and search that. And this uh, this tool helps you a lot. Okay, so I'm gonna wait this, hoping that <laughs> it will be finished and my computer will still be alive. But Protobuf editor is called, okay? Plugin in Rider. Okay, I'm seeing some blue stuff. So now I'm seeing suggestions. Okay, so you have here things suggested that are very cool. For example, you can add, uh, pff, I don't know, age. Uh, and remember, it's not an assignment, it's the order of the fields, okay? So uh, it helps you write proto syntax in Rider. It's the only thing, uh, part where I found this. Cool. So um, I think this is it. Thank you for listening. Um, I will uh, tweet the the link for the the resources for this, the slides and uh, the GitHub. You can you will be able to run it by yourself. Thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, Arena. That was uh, excellent, excellent talk. Uh, thanks for showing Rider there at the end. That Proto uh, Buff Editor plugin is awesome. It's, it's, it's gold. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you, it's gold. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good. So uh, chat has been kind of blowing up with a lot of questions. Uh, so we're just going to kind of go through them and hopefully you have the answers. Um, if you don't, uh, that's okay. Maybe we can get the answers uh, to folks later. But uh, first question, and I think maybe this, I don't know if it's a joke or not, but uh, it, it's its uh, its a good question. Um, is gRPC some kind of SOAP evolution? Uh, would it be more suitable to service-oriented applications instead of microservices? Uh, and the, the person continues, uh, where we usually have a service bus for async communication. So uh, is it an evolution of SOAP? Yeah, uh, I can say that it's somehow an evolution of SOAP, but some people also say that GraphQL is also an evolution of SOAP. <laughs> so I know Michael <laughs> is up next. Uh, so no, <laughs> it depends. If you have service bus and you also have messaging inside your system, then mm -hmm. yeah, I think there is no point of using gRPC. But when you first start with the microservices, the go-to option for all developers I promise you this, is making HTTP clients and distributing them. 
So mm -hmm. this is another way of making um, another step uh, into evol evolving their architecture. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, let's try gRPC if we still have point-to-point -point communication. It's very neat to use. Okay, very cool. Thank thank you so much. Uh, I think Rachel, uh, you have a question. Yeah. So uh, Joel asked if you can use gRPC in clean architecture, and what is the best way to do that, considering uh, some things like authentication, using identity or identity server. Um, regarding uh, authentication and securing things in gRPC. Um, I advise them to have a look in the Mark Randall's book. It's a free book um, that you, they can fi find on uh, on Docs. Uh, that free book mentions a lot of things about authentication. You can have per call or per channel. You can have JVT tokens, it, pretty much everything that you have out there. If you have REST APIs, for example, you have G things included in headers. And in here, you might include those things in the, in the channel when you create the request and so on. Yeah, I, I noticed in your samples, you're using an ASP.NET Core uh, NuGet package uh, developed by the team at Microsoft. Um, uh, I also noticed it's actually gRPC is based on HTTP2. So yeah. uh, it, it almost makes sense that it's built on top of the ASP.NET Core stack, which means you can just add any kind of middleware or uh, you know, identity server in this case, and like your GP gRPC calls will flow through uh, all those registrations that you made. Uh, so is is that correct? Uh, yep. So. Yep. Oh, okay. awesome. It's on .NET stack, so everything that's out there can be used as long as you know where to plug them in gRPC, and you're mm -hmm. as long as you're getting familiar. Okay, you have only post requests. You can mimic headers but you can have other infrastructure on top of it, like that channel that you're opening to mm -hmm. for communication and that can be secured. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's nice from a technological standpoint because, uh, you know, if, if uh, the, the last person asked about SOAP, I know people are asking about WCF, but uh, you don't have to worry about like envelopes and security, oh, no. and all, all, like th those difficult features of those, uh, you know, frameworks that maybe turn some people off. So GRPC indeed, indeed. Yeah. So, so uh, cool. as I, as I mentioned, uh, gRPC is uh, compared with WCF as being uh, an evolved WCF. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of things over WCF, but uh, indeed, it 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 depends on what world you are coming from. Yeah. So um, one other question I think a lot of people were asking in different variations is. Um, you showed how you link those proto files from an existing solution, right? So it's on disk, but uh, once you start to scale out your infrastructure, uh, how do you share those proto files? And a follow-up question from Martin, uh, our colleague from earlier, uh, once you start to scale up, how do you version those proto files so that you don't break clients? Uh, indeed, um, it's a tricky part, but how do you share those files? It's up to you. you. Need to have a mechanism. It's it depends on how you you use Docker, you use what. So it's a simple file that needs to get to a specific location overall. Um, in terms of versioning, uh, you need to rely on the versioning that Protobuf syntax offers. Mm -hmm. You can mark fields as deprecated and so on. So it, it's still a problem, and the versioning part is still a problem even in REST. <laughs> so I. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, versioning is very difficult to do, so it uh, yeah. takes a lot of time. So, uh, Rachel? Yeah, so Tom's asking, is it possible and recommended to dump WCF altogether in favor of gRPC? Uh, might there be features in WCF that are not available in gRPC, such as binary data transmission, named pipes? Uh, does gRPC always use HTTP2? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know. By default, it uses HTTP2, but I cannot tell you if you can switch it with something else. By default, it's HTTP2 because it was made for performance. And I think it's a good idea if you can get rid of WCF because it's an old technology. And as far as I know, it's not kind of maintained. Uh, and um, always moving on to new technology is uh, it's good <laughs> for the business, at least. And for the developers that work with uh, at that business, 
Um, it has all the modes that WCF has. You, uh, they can find a lot of things inside that book. Full duplex is bi <laughs> bi-directional uh, communication, and the thing is that it happens inside one single TCP connection, which is which is cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I read in the documentation you can go down to HTTP 1.1, but it's not really recommended. You kind of lose the benefits of gRPC at that point. So, yep. Um, yeah, I mean, a follow-up question I had was. Uh, have you heard anything about as the .NET team starts to move towards uh, HTTP3 protocol and quick, um, how will that impact gRPC performance? Uh, will it get better? Will it stay the same? I think they are studying quick and HTTP3, but mm -hmm. I didn't hear, I personally didn't hear anything about impacting gRPC at the moment because there are a lot of things that uh, people that are adopting uh, mm -hmm. gRPC and I think they will allow gRPC to function as it is for a while without uh, <laughs> creating too much damage on these people okay. because it's still yeah. new. Yeah, it's it's still pretty new. So yeah, thank you. Rachel, do you have uh, any other questions? Yeah, there's uh, still more questions coming in. So uh, is it easy to set an NLB that serves several gRPC servers in a farm or cloud? To set up a what? I think An NLB. A, I think it's a load balancer. Uh, I think oh. that's what that stands for. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's hard. I never did it. Uh, but it's still a server that exposes things and that can be called. So I, I assume from intuition that is as hard as it is for a web API, for example. It's still an endpoint there somehow. Yeah, I, I would also assume that too, right? So it's it's on HTTP two. Uh, any any scaling that you do on a web server, you probably do on these endpoints as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I, I guess another question. Um, you know that we saw a lot of code generation. I think source code generation is the topic of the day here today. <laughs> but uh, we saw you generate C sharp code. Is there any way to actually do code first gRPC that you know of? Um, nope. But I might be <laughs> ignorant in this. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't I mean, know. It looks like the proto files are, are a good way to kind of do design first. So um, I'm not sure code first gets you anything, but I know people coming maybe from Entity Framework might like a code first mm -hmm, mm -hmm, style. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Well, since we're on the subject of generation, uh, Oleg was asking if gRPC supports uh, JavaScript client Java uh, generation. Uh, we need to look at protobuf. Protobuf. Yeah, it has uh, it has the, uh, Java script, Java and other Python. I think it's on developers.google. I think mm -hmm. they can find there all the languages that are supported. Not all of them are supported, but uh, the, the important ones <laughs> are there. Did did Oleg C++, mean C sharp Dart go? Yeah, did Oleg mean though from like uh, JavaScript from a Node.js perspective or JavaScript from like uh, React or Vue? Oh, Oleg, or like if you want to chip in here, he did not specify. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Michael, who's up next, uh, said he's listening. You said something 10 minutes ago and, and I just see a what <laughs> in the comments. So I'm very interested in this one. It was about the, the it is. soap part, I think. The soap <laughs> part with <laughs> well, well, uh, Martin suggested we bring Michael in early and uh, you folks can have a protocol death match, but... Uh, oh we, no, we you should have a separate show for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I guess we're still waiting for Oleg to kind of clarify uh, from that perspective. Um, uh, but, well, in in yeah. the meantime, there was a few people asking for uh, if there's any samples that you happen to have, and specifically samples of gRPC with Blazor. Yeah, Blazor's the hot thing right now, um, as well. And I don't Martin have just Blazor, <laughs> but, nothing with Blazor. But there are a few uh, on 
uh, I noticed a few circling uh, on Twitter, I think. I was going to say, I seen a few uh, from Googling and just kind of poking yeah. around to see what's going on with this. So they're out there, folks. Go ahead and just oh, do yeah. a web search. I think they'll come up quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still looking through the questions here. Um, let's see. You know, I, I guess gRPC was really built by Google. I think you mentioned it was like called Stubby when it first originally mm -hmm. was created. <laughs> Um, what problems were they trying to solve? And as people adopt gRPC, where are some places that you've seen gRPC start to pop up in, uh, you know, technology offerings? Uh, to be honest, I don't know what they're, the, the, what were the problems they were trying to solve. Uh, I think about serialization and, uh, let's say, polyglot environments, I think, at that moment in 2001, it wasn't <laughs> that, that, that cool. <laughs> Um, and I'm seeing a lot of projects that have WCF moving and changing to, uh, to gRPC. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the, the go-to option, WCF gRPC. And now with gRPC web, they will also be able to communicate with the gRPC server directly from the browser mm -hmm. and, uh, developers might have a look at that. It might be interesting <laughs> in terms of development in future years. Yeah, if, if there's like a use case out there or like a technology that has adopted gRPC, like what would the flagship product or tool or uh, company, uh, obviously Google, but uh, other than Google, be using gRPC today? Like where would people look to, to I guess, learn more about gRPC from a company doing it? Uh, good question um, that I do not know how to answer. Um, I really don't know. I mean, protocol buffers were there as a concept for, for a while. Uh, Avro also was there and beating with, um, with gRPC. Uh, I don't know. I will have to look into it. And I will promise I will create a blog post. It's a very interesting question. Never uh, popped into my head. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I've seen Microsoft starting to use uh, gRPC and Dapper, which are their microservices mm -hmm. framework. Uh, I know Rachel had uh, Labrina on a while back. Yeah, and I think we have a it. talk coming up today with those topics in it. Um, today or tomorrow, later, it's on our shift. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I've personally seen gRPC kind of pushed uh, inside of microservices frameworks um, and frameworks like Dapper and stuff like that. So... Um, do you have any other, did uh, anybody else kind of bring in any questions or, um, I only really see one more, uh, Rachel. Did uh, we cover the um, bit of differences between SignalR and gRPC and the relationship there? No, I mean, I, I guess that's a good question to ask. There's um, a few questions on that. Like how does it differ from SignalR? Well, uh, it's not the same. I think not uses web sockets, right? As far as I know, um, and it has different purposes. I mean, this should be somehow server to server communication. When SignalR is server to clients, like front ends and so on, the push notifications and everything. Uh, but just noticed, noticed, just crossed my mind. Grpcio, uh, if people want to have a look. There are a lot of resources. Uh, apparently, gRPC it's used by Netflix. Um, just to answer your question, I forgot about gRPC IO. Yep, uh, I shared that gRPC IO in the uh, chat, so folks can kind of go look at that and kind of see uh, who's using gRPC, what gRPC is about, and how to define your services and contracts. Um, yeah, I. I let me see here. I think there's one more. Um, you know, for, from your recommendation, you kind of hinted at it the last uh, in the last comment. You said, uh, "Is gRPC really for building internal infrastructure? Can people use it for public APIs? Uh, what's your recommendation there?" Can you repeat that? It's, I'm losing connection. 
<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so if someone's choosing gRPC, would they pick it for more internal service-to-service -service usage, or would you recommend gRPC for public APIs? No, uh, for internal usage, for sure. I mean, service-to-service, -service, uh, point to point communication, if you do not have uh, messaging involved, um, for sure it's the right, uh, the right uh, opportunity to use gRPC. Uh, but for public facing APIs will rest as a concept or uh, JSON over HTTP, uh, mm -hmm. still it's the, the go to option. I mean, it's understandable. It's uh, easy, it's readable, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, inside your code, you can do whatever you want in there. But when you come with your code to the public and you expose it, then uh, something that is human readable might be nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I know our next guest might recommend a different protocol. Uh, yeah. APIs, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, you know, on that note, that's probably a good segue. And uh, we just want to thank you. I think that was a great talk. And uh, folks building infrastructure should definitely check out gRPC, um, the binary serialization uh, that you showed from the different types of methods. Uh, or the different types of calls. That was really, really cool. So thank you. JetBrains thanks you. And thank you for being a great speaker. Awesome. Thank talk. you for having thanks me again. Yeah. See you later.